All right, so let's discuss how uh, just some basics about the prokaryote uh, form and function. We're going to actually distinguish between eukaryotes and prokaryotes while we go through this. Um, so prokaryotes can be distinguished from the eukaryotes in several ways. One way is by the way their DNA is packaged, and you remember the DNA is the nuclear material in the nucleus. Hopefully by now you know that. Um, in a eukaryote, they have a, a nucleus, and as you know, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, so the DNA or um, whatever the nuclear material is, is is not housed inside of a nucleus. Um, another thing about DNA specifically is that in a prokaryote, there are no histones, and in a eukaryote, it's a protein that the DNA is wrapped around. Um, prokaryotes don't have it. Um, the cell wall is also different because they have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan, which you remember is um, sort of a, a protein sugar um, molecule. And in eukaryotes, if they have a cell wall, which many don't, um, it is it, it's a it's like a plant, for example, is a cellulose cell wall. Um, and there are some other things that we'll discuss regarding this cell wall a little bit later. Um, their internal structure is significantly different because prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles. Okay, So we don't have things like mitochondria or Golgi apparatus and things like that that we have in the eukaryotes. There are some membranes in certain um, bacteria or prokaryotes, um, but they aren't actually organelles. All right, so all bacterial cells possess a few things in common. One is a cell membrane, right? Um, might be called a plasma membrane. Um, they all have cytoplasm, which is the liquid portion that everything is floating around in inside the cell. They all have ribosomes because they all need to produce proteins. Uh, they all have a cytoskeleton. It may differ. Um, some cytoskeletons are used for movement, um, some simply for structure, and some for structure more than others, and so on. Uh, all of them have to have chromosomes. Either one or a few. None of them have um, lots and lots of chromosomes like uh, more advanced animals. Um, most bacterial cells have a cell wall which we'll discuss uh, what that actually is in, in a little bit, um, and a, <clears throat> a coating around the cell wall called a glycocalyx. And some structures that some have, but not all, uh, flagella, pili, or pili, and fimbriae. Now, these are all appendages that we'll, that we'll discuss, um, and an outer membrane, which uh, comes from mutations that allow it to be more resistant to certain things. Plasmids, which are just little pieces of DNA that are actually separate from their main chromosome. Inclusions, which are usually molecules that are stored, um, or, you know, even lots of molecules like fats and things like that. Um, endospores, or spores, which are very resistant um, forms of the prokaryote that allow it to um, almost hibernate when conditions aren't just right. Intracellular membranes, as I've mentioned before, membranes that are not uh, organelles. So here's the basic properties of prokaryotic cells. So on the outside, there are certain appendages, flagella, pili, fimbriae, um, a glycocalyx, which can be in the form of a capsule or a slime layer. Um, a cell envelope, all of them have this. Some of them have an outer membrane. Um, all of them have a cell wall, and all of them have a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. And then inside the cells, all of them have cytoplasm. All of them have ribosomes. All of them have inclusions. They all have some sort of a genetic material. All of them have some form of a cytoskeleton. Some of them can create an endospore, um, some plasmids, and some of them have intracellular membranes. So figure 3.1 in your book is what we're going to be discussing here for a little bit. And you're probably going to want to be thumbing back and forth um, 
in your book as we're going through this so you can see what uh, we're discussing. Um, but let's kind of run through this picture a little bit. So this yellow layer right here represents the cell membrane. Um, cytoplasmic membrane, plasma membrane, you're going to hear it probably called some different things. I'll usually call it the cell membrane. So a thin sheet of lipid and protein, generally it's going to be phospholipid um, as the main component, um, but lots and lots of proteins as well. And this serves to be what we call a semi-permeable membrane um, along with the rest of the uh, coverings of the cell to let certain things in and, and keep certain things out. Um, this right here represents the chromosome. Now remember it's not housed in a nucleus, so they might call it a nucleoid because it might be all bunched together. These little blue things here represent the ribosomes where we make protein um, from mRNA um, or some form of RNA. Um, cytoskeleton, these filaments right here are actually little actin filaments, um, which you may recall from human anatomy um, are the protein that we have in the sarcomere um, of the muscle cell that uh, reacts with the myosin. Um, cytoplasm, water-based of course, um, that is the fluid part that houses all of the uh, things floating around in it. Now this particular cell has fimbriae, um, which if, you've, if, if you remember that word you've heard before, um, because the fallopian tubes in the, in the female have these little finger-like projections off of the ends of them that sit over the top of the uh, ovaries to help sweep the egg into the fallopian tube. So sort of the same thing here um, on this particular cell, obviously not for an egg. Um, an outer membrane, so uh, this is supposed to say lipopolysaccharide, a little error there, um, also helps control things that come in and out and, and help it become more resistant. And a cell wall, which is this darker pink one here, that provides structural support for the cell and allow it to be more rigid. Um, and remember, this outer membrane is not present in all um, cells. All right, this structure right here is a pilus. Not all of them have it. Py uh, Pilo means hair. It's not a hair, but it apparently looks like one. But it's a it's a hollow tube that some prokaryotes can use to transfer their DNA over across to other cells. Um, this right here, as I said, was the the capsule, which is just a glycocalyx um, that is, I guess, more substantial. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later. This right here represents an inclusion or a granule or an inclusion granule. Um, which, as it says here, can be stored fats, nutrients, things like that, um, that the, the prokaryote can use later. Um, this here was, would be an example of a plasmid, um, which is just a, a little piece of DNA, not part of the chromosome, however. Um, it is extra genes, and it can transfer these genes. Um, and I guess they serve different purposes in, in different bacteria. This right here is a flagellum, um, which is a little tail that spins around to propel the bacterium. Uh, of course not all of those, uh, not all of them have them. Um, and down here, it's not, this particular bacterium doesn't have it, um, but some will have an endospore, which um, as we had mentioned is like a dormant, uh, more resistant body that's not really doing anything, it's just waiting for conditions to become um, ideal. And some of them, as we said, also will have intracellular membranes. So most prokaryotes exist as unicellular organisms, meaning just one cell, not in a relationship or a group. But they can act as a group um, in these things called colonies or sometimes in biofilms, um, either the same species or actually many different species. And there's some really complex um, relationships among these uh, organisms that we'll talk about a little bit in a few chapters. Um, so they communicate to each other so that they can have what's called a symbiotic relationship through these chemicals or by transferring electrons through something called a nanowire, which is not a wire, but it's a very small filament that electrons can pass through. So on average, prokaryotic cells are about a micron 
or a micrometer, which is a millionth of a meter. Um, however, they can be as small as 0 0.05 microns to as big as 750 microns. And these smaller ones have gotten the name, which, by the way, they haven't um, known about these for all that long, comparatively. Um, but they call these things nanobes, and, um, which is nano and microbe put together, um, which means a billionth. So we classify these organisms in a couple of different ways. And so we're going to look at table 3.1 as we kind of discuss a few of the uh, different characteristics of these. So this up here is the coccus shaped, um, or cocci is seen, uh, plural for this. And so they're basically little round things. They look like a cluster of grapes. Bear in mind, these colors here, are not uh, these are artificially colored so they're not necessarily colored like a purple grape um, and they don't have to actually be perfectly round just any roundish shape is considered to be a cock caucus shape um, down here we have a rod shape or a bacillus bacilli is plural for bacillus and these are basically elongated um, you know micrococcus bacillus is a name you've probably heard. I can pretty much guarantee you've heard of lactobacillus. For example, lactobacillus acidophilus, which is you know the big probiotic um, that you hear about on TV commercials. Down here we have what is called a vibrio. So vibrio is sort of twisted, not as twisted as another one that we're going to come up against here in just a second, um, but slightly curved. All right, so this one here is a spirillum. So spirillum, as you can see, are more twisted than the vibrio. And as it says here, it has to be twisted at least twice. Um, this here is a spirochete. Uh, again, even more twisted than the spirillum. It says it resembles a spring here. And at the bottom, these things called branching filament. So filament is um, a fiber. Um, an example is streptomyces. Myces means fungus, but it's not because it is a fungus. It's because it resembles a fungus. So there's a term called pleomorphism. So morph means form. Um, and there are this concept is that not all of the individuals in a species are going to be exactly the same size or shape. So they can vary based on things like nutritional differences, um, whatever they happen to be living in, um, or just their genetic makeup. Kind of like people are a little bit different, um, so can bacteria be. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind because you can't say there's like a hard and fast rule every time of identifying these things based on their shape. So there are also some unique arrangements that occur kind of based on their shape, um, mainly influenced by how they divide and, and as I said, the shape of the cells, but also how the cells remain attached afterward if they do. So example is cocci, they show the greatest variation in their arrangements. And this picture here just shows some differences. So if the cells divide in one plane, what you end up with is uh, this a chain. And it can, if it's just two, it's called a diplococcus. But a streptococcus is a longer chain. And so basically what happens is it just keeps adding and adding and adding to the chain. And they stay connected on these ends. If they divide in two planes, which would make this a three-dimensional structure, we can end up with a cube. Now, first of all, we're going to end up with what's called a tetrad, which is just packets of, of four, typo there, sorry. Or, once it becomes three-dimensional, you get these things called sarsena. So, eight to 64 cells. So, it'd be like eight, 16, um, those sorts of numbers that would all make a cube. Now, if we have division in several planes, you get these clusters. So staphylococci and micrococci both um, end up forming these clusters. 
So that was cocci, or cocci. Bacilli also show up in some, some specific arrangements. They show less variation, though, because they only divide in a transverse plane, unlike cocci. Um, so they can occur as a single cell, of course, where they don't stay attached. Or they can be a pair of cells called a diplobacilli, or that'd be plural, diplobacilli. Um, streptobacilli would be chains of several. Um, you can also get what is called a palisades arrangement, which is instead of them being hooked on the end, they're hooked sort of toward the end, and so you end up getting this sort of accordion-shaped arrangement because they hinge each other. All right, so let's move on to the external structures of prokaryotes. Appendages. So that's just a word that means stuff that sticks off of them, okay? Um, some of these are a little iffy on whether they stick off or not, but just go with it. Um, so not all species have appendages, and there are basically two groups. We have the appendages that provide motility, and motility, if you don't know, means the ability for the organism to move through its environment, um, and those that provide attachment points or channels. So the first one is the flagellum, plural is flagella, and these provide locomotion, which as I said was moving through the environment. So there's three distinct parts to the flagellum, and that's what you're looking at over here. It looks like Captain Hook's hand over here, or hook, I guess, lack of hands. Anyway, we have the filament, which is just this uh, long part that's it's flexible and squiggly. The hook, which is this part where we have this rigid bend, um, that's what actually creates the propeller-like motion. Um, we have the sheath, which will actually is the, sh the hook. This, this covering over here creates this bend. Um, we have the basal body, which includes all of this, which is essentially the motor. It's kind of the apparatus that gets this thing to start spinning around, all right? So it's comprised of a bunch of different proteins, and it's unlike the one that we're going to talk about when we get to the eukaryotic structures. Um, so the way this one moves, it's different. Again, not like eukaryotes. This one actually spins around um, instead of wiggles. So it's more like a boat propeller. So all spirilla have them. Some of the bacilli and a small number of the cocci have them. Um, so there's two general patterns that we're going to run into. You're either going to see a polar arrangement, and a pole is an end. It's just a, a word that means end, like we have on our Earth, the north and the south poles, the ends of the Earth. Um, so of these polar arrangements, we have three subtypes. We have monotrichus. Trick means hair, kind of like pili. Um, again, these aren't hair, but they resemble hair, and that's kind of how these things got their names. So mono, of course, means um, single, like a mono shock on a dirt bike or whatever. So monotrichus is a, is a single flagellum. Lophotrichus are bunches or tufts of flagella. flagella. So this is a monotrichus, and this one over here would be lophotrichus. Amphitrichus, amphi means two, like an amphibian has two life cycles, one in the water, one out of the water, by and large. Um, and so an amphitrichus has these flagella on both ends. Um, the other arrangement, besides a polar arrangement, so notice these are all ends, right? Tuft on the end, single on the end, and then two on the ends. But the other arrangement is what we call peritrichus, and peri means around. So that would be um, this one over here on the far right, where it's dispersed over the whole entire cell. So the way they work is, as I said, it's like a motor, the um, basal body. The molecules transmit signals to the flagellum and make them spin. So it's chemical reactions, as always. And the fuel for the flagellum is actually hydrogen ions, which, as you know, is, are protons, because most hydrogen ions re exist in the world as, as uh, protium. Um, so what they do is they bind and detach to different parts of the flagellum to cause it to spin around. It, pr it works kind of like a water wheel, 
Um, it's hard to explain. It doesn't really matter. All right, so kind of a strange arrangement that we'll find is this thing called these things called periplasmic flagella. So peri means around, plasmic obviously pertains to the, the cytoplasm or the plasma membrane. I'm not exactly sure which, but it doesn't matter. Um, also known as these things called, or also known as axial filaments. So they're only found in spirochetes, and they're actually found between the cell wall and the cell membrane, which is strange because they're not in contact with what's outside of the cell. So what it does is it causes these things to sort of wiggle. Um, it doesn't actually, as I said, contact whatever fluid they happen to be living in to help them to move through it, um, although it does help them to move just in a sort of a different way. Um, so let's talk about how bacteria move. So they move in response to chemical signals, and the name for that is called chemotaxis. Um, chemo, chemical, taxi, move. So they move based on chemicals. So there are receptors on these that will bind to molecules of whatever they happen to be inside of, which will trigger the flagella to rotate and spin. It's kind of like a dog sniffing out a, you know, a raccoon or a bear or whatever. Um, if you're into hound dogs, you know what I'm talking about, um, which I'm not, by the way but I had brothers. Anyway, um, so positive chemotaxis is the, is the term we use for movement toward a chemical signal. And this would be an example, or nutrients would be an example. It's trying to seek out nutrients, right? So it's going to move toward it. Um, negative chemotaxis is the opposite, movement away. And so an example of this would be if they're in some sort of a toxic environment, they would be moving away from where the concentration of the toxin is higher. Um, so there are these specific types of motions. One is called a run, um, and this is a smooth linear movement. So this right here would be an example of a run because it's going in a straight line. Um, but what if it needs to turn a corner? Okay, and these things don't have brains. They're not thinking about this stuff, so it's all based on chemistry, right? Well, when they get to something that they need to go away from or when they sense a, a chemical that's desirable in the opposite direction, it's going to cause them to go into this motion that we call a tumble. And this just shows how a polar and a peritrichous um, uh, bacteria will go through both of these motions. When Escherichia coli moves in a medium that lacks a concentration gradient, the cell travels, stops, or tumbles, and then continues moving in a new random direction. When the flagella rotate counterclockwise, the flagella form a tight bundle and propel the cell forward in a run. After a brief period, the direction of rotation is reversed, causing a tumble. As cells move up a chemical gradient, the runs are longer than when they travel down the gradient. The overall result is random movement in the absence of a chemical gradient and movement toward a chemical when a gradient exists. Attractant chemicals bind to chemoreceptors called methyl-accepting chemotaxis proteins, located in the cell membrane. The cytoplasmic side of the MCP interacts with two proteins, KW and KA. When the MCP is not bound to an attractant, it stimulates KA to phosphorylate itself using ATP. KA autophosphorylation is inhibited when the attractant is bound to its MCP. Phosphorylated KA can donate its phosphate to the response protein KY. When KY is phosphorylated by KA, it moves to the flagellum. This causes the flagellum to rotate clockwise and tumble. Thus, a decrease in attractant promotes short runs and tumbling. KW is an adapter protein mediating communication between receptors and KA. The phosphate on KY is continually removed by KZ. The short lifetime of phosphorylated KY means that the bacterium is very responsive to changes in attractant concentration. When no attractant is present, the cell maintains intermediate levels of KA phosphate and KY phosphate. This produces a normal run-tumble swimming pattern. When a chemoattractant binds to MCP, 
the levels of Ky phosphate drop. The lack of phosphorylated Ky results in counterclockwise rotation of the flagella and long smooth runs. Escherichia coli must be able to ignore past stimulus responses so that it can compare the most recent attractant concentration to the immediately previous one. This is accomplished by methylation of the methyl accepting protein. Key R continuously methylates MCP whereas phosphorylated key B removes these methyl groups. When the attractant is bound to MCP, the complex becomes a good substrate for key R and a poor substrate for key BP. The levels of key YP and key BP drop because phosphorylation of key A is inhibited. Removal of the attractant causes the overmethylated MCP to stimulate key A autophosphorylation, and the levels of key YP and key BP increase. This simultaneously induces tumbling and demethylation so that the system returns to a lower level of key A autophosphorylation. Okay, so moving on with these prokaryotic appendages. Um, we talked about the ones that are responsible for movement of the cell. And so these next ones we're going to talk about are not for movement. So they are for attachment and mating. So the first one we're going to discuss are called fimbriae. Fimbriae are these fibers that come off of the um, bacterium that they use for attachment. Um, this is how some bacteria attach to things that would normally be difficult to attach to, like um, rocks and glass and um, surfaces like that. Um, they're also partially responsible for creating what we call biofilms, which we're going to get to in just a little bit. Another one is called a pilus. All right, pilus is, is singular, pili is plural. And these structures are used for conjugation. So this picture right over here to the right is, is somehow showing fimbriae and pili. Um, I don't exactly know what the difference is here. I don't, I don't even see this pointing to anything, but certainly these things right here are pili because what they do is one will go from one uh, bacterium to the next bacterium and interact with each other in this, this exchange called conjugation, which is sort of like mating, um, certainly not in the respect that we're used to. Um, but the protein that these things are made out of is called uh, pilin, which pili, as I've told you, I think earlier, means hair. And so what they do is they transfer DNA. They don't transfer all of the DNA, um, but it does help with genetic variation. And if you know anything about evolution and adaptation and things like that, um, you've probably heard that genetic variation is what allows species to adapt to their environment and become uh, more uh, what they call fit. So that brings us then to another appendage that we call the glycocalyx. And again, it's kind of a stretch in my imagination, at least, as to why this thing is an appendage, because to me, an appendage sticks off of something like an arm or a leg. But anyway, the glycocalyx is this surface. Uh, it, it actually covers the surface. And make sure you don't get this confused. Um, look back at that picture that I showed earlier, because and it's listed as the capsule on the picture on, on uh, figure 3.1. Um, but don't get it confused with the outer membrane. The glycocalyx is on the outside of the outer membrane. And so we talk about the envelope of the cell. Um, I don't know if we've talked about it yet, but we will if we haven't. Um, being three layers. The outer layer is the outer membrane, if it even has one. Um, but even more outer than that, is this glycocalyx and so it would really turn it into a four layer um, shell so to speak so it's made of polysaccharides proteins or both and it's going to vary in thickness based on the species and based on how long it's been there and what it's in and all kinds of things all right but what these bacteria use this thing for is for phagocytosis um, or actually to avoid phagocytosis of like a white blood cell or even another bacterium 
um, and also for adhesion to certain things. So biofilms are an example of how it adheres to something. Um, the easiest example, because we all know what it is, is plaque on your teeth. Um, that's actually a biofilm that these bacteria actually produced so that they can stick to your teeth and be protected. They create sort of a little cocoon around themselves. And so what this is showing here, this is an electron microscope picture, um, but this is some sort of a structure, maybe a tooth. We'll just say it's a tooth. And so along comes these bacteria. They stick to it, and they begin, begin producing around themselves this glycocalyx. All right. Then along comes other microbes, and, and when we get multiple microbes together, they all start to produce these things in this synergistic effect, and we get this uh, biofilm, which is sort of this greenish, you know, slimy, waxy, whatever around these things. And what that does, like I said before, is it creates a little protective cocoon um, so that the white blood cells, they don't even recognize that it's a foreign object in the first place because there's no exposed uh, antigens on the surface of these cells. So there are different names for this glycocalyx. Um, a, a slime layer is a glycocalyx, but it's uh, more of uh, that it's in, in, embedded in this in this layer. All right, and we can have there is another one we'll get to in just a second that's actually a little more uh, tightly bound to the cell itself. Um, but what it does is, as I said, it just shields it, keeps it from losing water, keeps chemicals, you know, like mouthwash, I suppose, since we're on that example of plaque, from uh, damaging the bacteria. Now, there's another name. So it's still a glycocalyx, but if it is more tightly bound to the actual cell, and if, again, if you look at 3.1, it shows an example of this, um, figure 3.1, we call it a capsule. All right, so if it's just sitting inside of some waxy stuff, uh, we call it a slime layer. But if it's actually attached to the uh, outer membrane or the cell wall, whatever the case may be, we call it a capsule. Okay, and this is showing a microscopic picture of a capsule. Um, you can sort of see this over here on the right, how it looks like a layer of slime. So that's where it gets its name, slime layer too. Um, but it basically, and, and there's no reason it can't have both, by the way. Um, so they negative stain this in order for us to see it under a microscope. So it produces a sticky mucoid, which means mucus-like. And these cells that can produce this capsule have a greater pathogenicity, meaning that they're more able to cause a disease. Not necessarily because they're tougher, you know, they, they, they do something better uh, as far as the disease goes, but what it means is we don't have the ability to fight them off as well because they have a little bit of extra armor. So which of these is not used for attachment? And of course the, the answer is flagellum because that is used for motility. Okay, let's talk about the cell envelope for just a little while here. So the cell envelope is the th two or three layers that lie outside of the cytoplasm. So some have two, some have three. All have at least two, okay? Uh, there may be actually some exceptions to that. Um, and here, here's what they are. The cell membrane, the cell wall, and some bacteria have an outer membrane. So the outer membrane is differentiated from those that don't have an outer membrane by what is called the Gram stain, and I think we talked about that in chapter one. So let's look at what the cell wall actually look, looks like. So this over here is a bacterium, and this purplish stuff on the outside is supposed to be showing the cell wall. Remember, this is a different kind of cell wall than what we have in, say, plants. So in plants, it's made of cellulose, which is just glucose. Um, but in bacteria, it is made of peptidoglycan, 
which, as you remember, is a sort of sugar protein complex, right? Peptide is the bond that puts the amino acids together into a protein. Um, and, and this right here is showing tetrapeptide. Um, you can see all of these things right here, alanine, glutamate, lysine. Um, these are all amino acids. And this right here is a sugar. So it is a, let's look here. It's a, it's a hexose sugar because there's six carbons on this thing. Um, so what it is is a repeating framework of these sugars with these peptide crosslinks uh, in between them. So, and, and this right here is showing the, the bridge. So you can see this structure is the same and this structure is the same. And then right here with all these glycines is what connects these two structures together there. So present in most bacteria and it helps provide, provide strength to resist rupturing during, uh, because of osmotic pressure because these uh, bacteria generally live in hypotonic solutions. And so it's constantly wanting to, uh, water is constantly wanting to diffuse into the cell in the process called osmosis. And what that would do if they, they didn't have the strength to resist the high pressure is they would fill up and fill up and eventually burst like a red blood cell would if it were in the same situation. Uh, but since this is very rigid, um, it doesn't happen. All right, so this just shows the peptidoglycan layer. So here's the cell membrane. And this is the peptidoglycan layer on the bacterium. And remember, the peptidoglycan is the cell wall. So I know it doesn't say cell wall right there, but don't forget, this is the cell wall. So this particular bacterium does not have, because we only have two layers here, so here's the phospholipid bilayer, and then we have the peptidoglycan cell wall, but we don't have the third layer, which is the outer membrane, which we will show you in just a minute. Um, so remember the envelope can be two or three layers, so this is the peptidoglycan layer of it. So one of the things it does, besides resisting osmotic pressure, is provides a framework, and that really helps uh, establish the shape of the bacterium. Um, some of them are very thick, and so they're more rigid than other ones. Um, and, and it's not the only thing that helps determine the shape. Don't forget that the cytoskeleton of the bacterium also helps determine the shape. And there are certain drugs, for example, penicillin, that target this. And so what has happened? Penicillin is a, is a fungus, right? And so what has happened is these fungi have developed methods to uh, kill bacteria so that they don't have to compete with them or damage them or whatever the case may be. I don't really know. Um, but scientists discovered back in the, uh, I don't know, 50s, I believe, maybe the 40s, uh, that they could actually use the same chemicals and treat disease that way, uh, bacteria at least. Um, and what it does is disrupts this uh, peptidoglycan cell wall, and it makes it easier for our own white blood cells to go in there and kill them. They're much, much, much less resistant. Okay, so then lysozyme can go ahead and destroy the cell, which is the enzyme that is in the lysosome of the white blood cell. So one thing that's important, I did not write this down here, I don't think. Um, but these bacteria that do not have an outer membrane are all gram positive. So they stain positive with the gram stain, right? Uh, so that brings us then to the other type, the gram negative cells. Gram negative cells have two membranes, not two layers. They have three layers, but two membranes. So they've got the outer membrane, which uh, the gram positive cells did not have which is all of this. So it sits just deep to the glycocalyx if it has a glycocalyx. It's not showing the glycocalyx here. Um, remember that was the, the, the capsule, but the, it would be on top of this. So that would give us the fourth layer, three of which would be part of the cell envelope. So anyway, all of this is cell envelope from here to here. 
has a thin peptidoglycan. Remember from the previous slide how thick the peptidoglycan layer was in the gram-positive cell? When in gram-negative cells, it's a lot thinner, uh, probably because it just doesn't need to be as thick and it doesn't need to waste the energy creating it. Um, these are more susceptible to lysis because of the thin peptidoglycan layer or cell wall. And it also makes them more flexible because this peptidoglycan is rigid, and so the thinner it is, the, the, the uh, less rigid it's going to be, right? So some things that uh, are, are unique about this particular outer membrane layer is they have these things called lipopolysaccharides. So let's break that word down. Lipo, fat, poly, many, saccharide, sugar. And so it's a fat sugar molecule. Um, it, it's it's a, um, a polymer. It's a polymer. Um, we also have these things called porins. Porins are basically a pore. Okay, it's a protein embedded in it, and you can see that it actually creates a channel. And these are for transporting things in and out of the cells. Okay, okay, so we do talk about it. So here's a gram-positive cell. That was gram-negative. Here's gram-positive. So it has a cell membrane. They all do. Um, but no outer membrane. It just has the thick peptidoglycan cell wall. So these are much more resistant to destruction. And in them, they have this tychoic acid and lipotychoic acid, which apparently contributes to uh, cell division when these things divide. Uh, and we'll get to that in a couple of chapters from now. Um, they stain positive in the gram staining because they don't have an outer membrane. And so what happens is the stain actually goes into this peptidoglycan. Okay? because there's no layer covering it and keeping it from doing that. So in order to actually determine what these are, we have to actually do an acid fast stain to identify them. Um, and these pathogens that we would be identifying are, are things that would cause tuberculosis, leprosy. Um, another interesting thing is archaea, which you should remember from uh, the end of chapter one was the other prokaryote besides the domain bacteria. So um, all of the organisms in this domain lack a peptidoglycan layer. So those are the non-typical cell walls. But we also have bacteria that don't have a cell wall. So this whole group called mycoplasmas. Myco means um, fungus, by the way. They're not fungi, though. Um, but they lack cell walls, and so they have to stabilize their cell membrane by sterols, which, by the way, so do animals, humans. Uh, we have cholesterol inside of our cell membranes um, to stabilize our cell membranes as, as well, um, and it's, a, a, of course, a type of sterol, right? Um, but these actually are very resistant, or at least somewhat resistant to lysis. There's also a group called L-forms. Um, or L phase variants, and they got their name because they were discovered at the Lister Institute. Um, they actually lose their cell wall during their life cycle, either because of uh, genetic mutation or because of some chemical um, like lysozyme or penicillin that causes it to break down. And so we have names for these L forms. Uh, one of them is called a protoplast. A protoplast is a, is a gram-positive bacterium that loses its cell wall. Um, and, of course, that makes it highly susceptible to lysis. Um, the example we just used was penicillin, right? A spheroblast is a gram-negative bacterium 
that loses its cell wall. And it leaves the gram-negative bacterium weak, but not as susceptible to lysis because remember, it's still got its outer membrane. And so it's still got two layers, which is going to make it um, a little more resistant. So this picture right here shows what we just talked about on the previous slide. Um, either because of mutation or chemical treatment, if we start with the gram-positive cell, what we end up with is a cell called a protoplast that only has a cell membrane because the cell wall is gone. A gram-negative cell um, loses its cell wall but we still end up having two layers, a cell membrane and an outer membrane, and that's what makes this more resistant to lysis than a gram-positive bacterium. And you can start to see, I think, why it's important that we know whether a bacterium is gram-positive or gram-negative um, in the treatment medically. You're going to cover most of the pathology um, as far as microbiology is concerned. In pathology class, we're not going to discuss a ton of it. Um, it's really this class needs to be broken up into two terms if we want to cover all of the uh, pathology. And so you're going to cover that in a different class. So let's talk about the outer membrane for a while, also known as the OM for short. I mean, no one's ever going to say the OM. Well, that's actually not true. They might. Um, but certainly when you're writing it, you can just write the outer membrane. So similar in construction to the cell membrane because of the phospholipid bilayer, right? We've got the uh, polar heads with the nonpolar tails, um, or ch not charged. So the, it serves as a semipermeable membrane because of those porin proteins that I showed you earlier. I should have thrown a picture up here. So the lipopolysaccharide, remember uh, lipids and uh, sugars all chained together, also known as endotoxin. Endo means within, toxin, of course, means toxin. Um, this endotoxin, or this lipopolysaccharide, is located on the outermost layer of the uh, outer membrane because it's a phospholipid bilayer, right? So there's an inner and an outer layer of the outer membrane. So these were on the basically the surface. That's a, probably a better way to say that. So what they do is they stimulate fever and shock in the human, or, or in, in any animal, I suppose, um, in infections like meningitis and typhoid. So your body actually uh, can sense these and it triggers fever. So it makes gram-negative bacteria more difficult to kill using chemicals, chemicals because they're more resistant. Now, alcohol-based compounds dissolve this outer membrane, but you can't inject yourself with alcohol. Um, we can, however, use alcohol to um, sanitize our hands. That's what we use Purell for. It's really good for uh, zombies, if you've ever seen the movie Zombieland. Um, so the cytoplasmic membrane, also known as the cell membrane or plasma membrane. Um, eukaryotes have this as well. So as I've said, it's a lipid bilayer. It's phospholipids primarily with proteins embedded in it. Um, bacterial cell membranes contain lipids, as I said, primarily phospholipids. Remember, that's a, disac or a diglyceride with a phosphate head or a, a phosphate on the third bonding site. So 30 to 40 percent of the membrane is, is phospholipid. Um, but also it contains a lot of proteins. And this, I think this ratio is significantly different in eukaryotic cells. It's more like 60 to 70% lipids and uh, 30 to 40% proteins and oligosaccharides and things like that. Um, but what these things do is provide sites for reactions. Um, you, if you remember from, you know, human anatomy or whatever, when we talk about the mitochondria, we use that for ATP production, and there's that inner membrane called the cristae, um, or those folds called the cristae in the inner membrane. And the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which we'll get to later on in this book, um, the chemical reactions that occur to create ATP molecules go back and forth across that. But remember, um, prokaryotes don't have cell membrane, or excuse me, uh, membrane-bound organelles, and so these things have to do all these 
same chemical reactions across their outer membrane, not outer, cell membrane. Um, wrong word there. Um, so they will have the same enzymes or similar ones at least to the ones that we have in our mitochondria to, to perform these same tasks. Um, also, this cell membrane is the main way that we regulate what comes in and out of a cell. This is what you hear called the um, semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. Okay, true or false, the outer membrane contributes an extra barrier in gram-positive bacteria that makes them impervious to some antimicrobial chemicals. So they are generally more difficult to inhibit or kill than our gram-negative bacteria. And that is false because it's the gram-negative bacteria that actually have the three layers, not the gram-positive. Awesome. Let's talk about the cytoplasm for a while here. So the cytoplasm, as you know, is the liquid part of the cell, and it contains, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So 70 to 80 percent of it is water, and it contains all the stuff that's dissolved in it, proteins, salts, carbohydrates. Um, if it were a eukaryote, it would also have organelles in it, but it's not. Um, but the DNA is in there and all of that stuff, right? So this is where almost all of the chemical reactions of, this, of the cell take place. Um, has the DNA in that area that we call the nucleoid. Um, and that's pretty much it on that. Let's talk about the DNA of a bacterium for a little bit. So most of the DNA is in a single circle. And since it's just one molecule, we call it a chromosome because each molecule is a chromosome. And as you remember, humans have a double set. And so we have a total of 46 chromosomes, um, bacterium, bacteria most or at least a lot have only one chromosome so as I've mentioned many times they are in the area called the nucleoid which is just a wad of DNA right um, a lot of bacteria have what we'd mentioned earlier was called that plasmid so if you remember back on that figure 3 1 there was that little circle at the bottom um, which was just a little short piece of DNA that we call a plasmid um, sometimes the plasmids are integrated into the chromosomes, and this contributes to mutations of the DNA of the uh, bacterium, and as we've said earlier, helps them to become uh, more adapted to their environment. Um, these plasmids are very easily manipulated in the lab, and so scientists use them for genetic engineering. They can actually the bacteria can can inject them into other hosts. Uh, that's probably the wrong word, um, but other organisms. And so the, if the scientists can uh, change the uh, plasmid by manipulating it in, in, into something that they want, then they can use the bacteria sort of as their minion to uh, get it to affect some other organism. So the ribosomes of prokaryotes, I hope you remember what a ribosome is in eukaryotes. Um, and prokaryotes alike, we use them for creating proteins, right? But the, they're not exactly the same in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, prokaryotes have thousands of them, and so do eukaryotes. Um, they are located free-floating in the cytoplasm. Now, remember, they are also in eukaryotes. However, they are also on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. But, of course, prokaryotes don't have an ER, and so they're only floating in the cytoplasm. So they can also be, though, in chains called polysomes. So they actually link up together for whatever reason, and, and when they're linked together into a chain like that, we call them polysomes. Poly means many, right? Um, they can be attached to the cell membrane. As far as I know, they are not in eukaryotes, um, but I could be wrong on that. So as I've said, this is where we synthesize protein, which is a fancy word for make. And just like in eukaryotes, they're made up of two subunits as well as mRNA, uh, not mRNA, rRNA, which stands for ribosomal RNA. Um, but they have a 30S and a 
50S subunit. And this S, I guess I should talk about what that is. Nothing you need to be stressed about. Um, but just quickly, it has to do, I believe, with sedimentation rate. And so when you centrifuge these things out, they'll sediment at the rate that they, they uh, drop, come down, and, and hit the bottom, essentially, varies. And so the faster it is, you know, the, I guess, bigger the number. Um, but the, so the sedimentation rate of the small unit is 30 and 50 for the large. And the t these don't add up, by the way, because if they did, it would be 80, but they add up. Uh, when we put them together into one unit, it's a 70S size versus in eukaryotes, these ribosomes are 80S. So 60% of the uh, ribosome is rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and then the rest is protein. Another structure that we find in some prokaryotes are these inclusions or granules, sometimes called inclusion granules, I've heard. Uh, that may be totally incorrect, but I've heard it. Um, so these are storage bodies, non-membrane bound granules inside of the cell, usually used for storage of nutrients. Um, some bacteria that are in um, an aqueous or marine environment um, use them to collect gas so that they can become more buoyant if they need to float or um, be at some specific uh, level of the uh, in in, a, in the water column. Um, some prokaryotes use these to store iron oxide, which of course has iron and is magnetic, and so they can use this to align themselves in polar fields somehow um, using the Earth's uh, polarity, uh, the, the electromagnetism of the Earth. All right, so the cytoskeleton. So remember we had mentioned that the peptidoglycan layer determines the shape of many bacteria especially the gram-positive bacteria, because it's thicker. Um, but others use protein fibers composed of uh, actin and tubulin, um, or in conjunction. I mean, of course, they could have both, right? Um, and remember, I think I mentioned this, but if actin looks familiar, it's because it's um, we see it in the uh, muscle. Um, in the sarcomere where it interacts with the myosin in order to create a muscle contraction. Um, but the other protein is tubulin. And so those are the, the little fibers inside of the cell that actually make up the um, cytoskeleton. So again, remember to look back at figure 3-1 while we're going through this um, to see what we're talking about. Okay, we are going to kind of switch gears here, still talking about structures of prokaryotes, um, but not necessarily the, the super common ones. So some bacteria create endospores, also known as spores, which are just dormant bodies that are very resistant to damage from things like radiation, heat, extreme cold, ultraviolet light, um, desiccation, which is drying out. Um, they're heat resistant due to some structures within them, uh, such as calcium and dipocalinic acid. Um, so what happens in, with these bacteria that, ha that can create an endospore is they have a two-phase life cycle. The first phase is called the vegetative phase. And that's just what we would consider to be the normal cell, okay? Just living in a normal environment, doing its thing, um, dividing, creating, you know, offspring, so to speak. But when conditions aren't ideal, they can turn into an endospore phase, okay? So this endospore actually starts out inside of the uh, vegetative cell. And what happens is, the, and so look at this picture right here. This right here is the endospore. This is either an inclusion body or maybe the nucleoid, I'm not exactly sure. But this right here is the endospore. And what happens is all of this material out here disintegrates 
And what you're left with is this endo endospore that is very resistant to whatever triggered this uh, to begin in the first place. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about sporulation, which is a fancy word for the process of creating a spore. And as I mentioned, due to environmental conditions. Okay, important. This is not reproduction. Okay, because you're not going from a cell that creates a spore that creates another cell. This spore doesn't, it just is essentially the same cell. Okay, so we're not going from one cell making two cells. We're going from one cell and making the same cell again, so to speak. Okay, so we don't end, end up increasing the um, number of cells. So once a, sor uh, a spore, once sporulation begins, the cell is called a sporangium. We don't, we don't call it, um, I should say we don't call it. I, I should just say it's just a, it's sort of a, a, a stage of the cell. So sporulation takes approximately six to eight hours. And we'll go through that process on the next slide coming up. So this, which is figure 320, 3.20 um, in your book is excellent in explaining how this whole process works. Okay, so here we begin with the vegetative cell right here. This is kind of our normal cell. So what happens when in, is when environmental conditions are uh, not ideal, something adverse occurs, um, we start to sporulate. So the first thing that begins to happen, the chromosome has to be duplicated, right? Um, this is kind of like interphase of mitosis, if you remember what that is. Um, then what happens is the cell begins to separate. So it, a septa, sep, uh, septa are formed here, and it separates it into sort of two cells, the cell membrane, um, not the cell wall. Um, then the sporangium right here engulfs this, what will become the spore. It's called the Spore spore. And the sporangium begins to uh, synthesize the layers around it. And then it, it, it puts this cortex around it. Cortex is just a word that means outside. But these this cortex is made of very resistant materials um, so that it can survive these adverse conditions that it's in. So once we have a mature endospore, then of course the um, sporangium disintegrates. And so what we're left with is our fully mature spore. So what happens then, this is going through the full life cycle here, um, so we've created our spore. So this thing could live for years, thousands of years as a matter of fact. Uh, and once conditions are um, ideal again, and this could be for a number of reasons. I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, certain chemical contents, um, concentrations of things like oxygen or um, water or whatever. What it'll do is it will trigger for what is called germination. And we will then um, produce another vegetative cell. And we're back to where we started again. Spore-forming bacteria grow as vegetative cells and divide by binary fission when nutrients are available and environmental conditions are not adverse. When nutrients are depleted or conditions become adverse, spore formation is initiated. The DNA condenses and aligns itself in the center of the cell. The vegetative cell is now referred to as the mother cell. Next, the DNA divides into two complete copies, and the mother cell membrane invaginates to form the developing four-spore. The mother cell membrane continues to grow and engulfs the developing spore. The developing spore is now surrounded by two membrane layers. Next, peptidoglycan is laid down between the two membranes of the developing spore to form the cortex. Dipicolenic acid is formed inside the developing spore, and calcium enters from the outside. As calcium enters the spore, water is removed. 
A protein coat forms exterior to the cortex and the spore becomes mature. Some spores form an additional layer called the exosporium. A mature spore is resistant to environmental conditions. Finally, lytic enzymes destroy the mother cell and the mature spore is released. One thing that's important about that is that the water leaves the cell. And the reason why that's important is, uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. But in the cold, for example, if there is water in it, when it freezes, what happens is the water crystallizes. And when it crystallizes, it essentially acts like knives and slices through everything and damages things. That's why uh, a person gets frostbite um, or why you can't. You know, when you freeze certain things like vegetables or fruits or whatever, when they thaw back out, they're they're floppy um, because of those crystals forming in there and damaging it. Um, same sort of things happen with heat. Um, if there's water in there, it it creates an environment for chemical reactions to occur. And so the drier it is, the longer it's going to last. I mean, that's why we freeze dry foods and things like that. So, once ideal conditions are back, we germinate, all right? And that's just returning from dormancy back to the vegetative state. Now, it took six to eight hours to become a spore, but it only takes about an hour and a half to germinate again. So, as I said, things like water, nutrients, temperature would be the things that would trigger germination. What happens is digestive enzymes begin to be secreted and it breaks down the membranes, those very, very tough, strong membranes in the endospore. And what that does is then allow water to come back into the cell in order to rehydrate it. So most spore forming bacteria are harmless. Um, however, some of them are not. Um, like anthrax is, is a common one used in bioterrorism because this thing, you know, it'll live essentially forever. Um, another one that's significant is uh, Clostridium, one of which is C. tetani, which is what causes tetanus, um, lives in soil, and this is why you get a tetanus shot. So when the spores of these things get into a wound, they can germinate and cause anthrax or tetanus, both of which are extremely deadly. Where in a prokaryotic cell would you find the genetic material? The nucleus, nucleolus, nucleocapsid, or nucleoid. And of course, we know that it is the nucleoid because they don't have a nucleolus or a nucleus. And the nucleocapsid is in a virus, which we will talk about, I think, next chapter. Okay, so remember the domain archaea. Um, so here are the three domains that we have, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, this chart here just shows some of the differences among them all. I'm not concerned that you memorize this whole entire chart, um, but maybe some things just to kind of think about for a second. So uh, the chromosomes of bacteria, either one chromosome or a few. There's never a, a lot of chromosomes. Um, they're circular. Um, archaea always have only one, and of course they're always circular. Eukaryotes could have a few to several, um, and they are linear, not circular. Um, ribosomes, 70S in bacteria. Remember that's the, the density of them essentially, 70S but structurally similar to the ADS in the eukaryotes, and the ribosomes of eukaryotes are ADS. No peptidoglycan in archaea or eukarya. Um, some eukarya have cell walls, but they're not peptidoglycan. Uh, membrane lipids, uh, nothing I'm too concerned about there. Um, sterols in the membrane, some have sterols in the bacterial membranes especially those with an outer membrane. Um, none in archaea, 
and all eukarya have them. As I mentioned before, cholesterol is one. So archaea are prokaryotic, or, uh, are prokaryotic organisms, prokaryotes, but they are more closely related to eukaryotes. So on the surface, they look more like bacteria, and that's why originally they thought that they were in the same domain. Um, but upon further inspection, they began to realize that they were more closely related to eukaryotes, and that's why you see that this domain branches off of the eukaryotes and not off of the prokaryotes. So many of these are found in extreme environments. Um, an example that should say EG, not IE, sorry, is a psychrophile, um, which psychro means cold, file means loving, so they're, they're in extremely cold environments. Um, and they're different from the members of the bacteria in eukarya, that's why they're their own domain, in terms of like we just went over, cell structure, metabolism, genetics, etc., etc. All right, which of the following do members of the domains bacteria and archaea both possess? And the answer is 70S ribosomes because eukaryotes have 80S. All right, so the classification of these things is not easy. Um, for one thing, there are so many of them. For another thing, they're super similar to each other. It's not as quite as cut and dry as, as classifying animals, for example. So they do it in different ways. And they've, there's this uh, classification system that considers relationships among these organisms and their, and, and their origins. Um, so Berge's Manual of Systematic Bacteriology is one of them. And it's based on phenotypic data. Phenotype is the appearance of something, as well as the ribosomal RNA sequencing data. So this is something that they couldn't even do, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and therefore, this this uh, is sort of a new concept, and, and that's kind of how they're discovering different species that before they thought were the same species. So for differentiating and identifying unknown, unknown microbial species, um, we use this manual of determinative bacteriology. And this is based only on the phenotypic data. So in a, I guess it's really not quite as um, specific would probably be the right word to use. So Berge's Manual of Determinative Bacteriology organizes these prokaryotes into four divisions and it bases it on their phenotypic structure of their cell wall. So the first category are these things called gracilicutes. So these are gram negative cell walls and so they're very thin skin. So you remember that the um, gram negative had the thin peptidoglycan layer, right? Firmicutes are gram positive cell walls and so these things are very thick and very strong. The division tenericutes don't have a cell wall and so they're very soft. And mendosicutes are archaea with unusual cell walls. You have undoubtedly heard of species, and you have probably heard of subspecies, okay? So sometimes it's still within the same species, but there's enough difference that they actually uh, consider some things to be subspecies, all right? So there is absolutely no black and white line that says this is where a species ends and this is where a new species begins, okay? It's very gray. And so what they do is they say somewhere in the 70 to 80% uh, area of sharing the same genetic material, we'll consider that to be um, all the same species, okay? But, you know, the way they determine this is literally by voting sometimes. They'll get it, get together in these um, groups, in these panels, and they'll, they'll try to decide what is a new species and what's still part of the same species. Um, 
So members of the same species can actually show different variations, as I mentioned before. And you may hear terms like subspecies or strain or type. And this is what uh, describes members of the same species that are, that are actually different. One word that you might hear is called serotype. And what this is, is when you, take, uh, when you look at blood chemistry, um, animals will create antibodies in response to an infection by a pathogen. And so if a specific uh, bacterium uh, creates a specific antibody, uh, then we can say that it's of the same serotype. You identify a bacterium as gram-negative using the gram stain method. In Burden's Manual of Determinative Bacteriology, this bacterium belongs to the... And the answer is gracilicutes, because permacutes was gram-positive. And tenericutes, no cell wall, mendocicutes were abnormal cell walls.